Hey, hey, everyone. I'm really excited to have uh, Dan Moscrop with me today. Um, just to kind of give you a bit of an introduction, the Parental CEO was created to help parents become successful both in business and in parenting. We always want to add value to our community by either sharing success stories or advice on how to kind of manage the best of both worlds. So, Dan, uh, can you give us a brief introduction uh, about yourself? Yeah, my name is Dan Moskop. I've been working in graphic design for uh, over 24 years now. Uh, and at the ripe old age of 29, I decided that I should start my own business. So I run an agency called Them. Um, and over the years, we've sort of focused a lot on uh, branding smaller organizations. Um, and then we sort of made the decision in the last sort of couple of years, uh, sorry, like eight years ago, to specialize in branding environments. So we now specialize in looking at people's workspace really on picking what their culture's about and then trying to represent it in their environment. Um, so the things that sort of really inspire me is looking at branding, how you can reinterpret it, and then sort of how you sort of try and capture culture within an organisation. So we work for people like McKinsey, um, British Sugar Booth, which have won British Council uh, Offices uh, Awards, um, and they're looking to win the Nationals this year. Um, and uh, working with people like Sony Music and... Um, McKinsey uh, and uh, yeah, numerous other really large companies. So we went from working with sort of small organisations right up to these big sort of massive blue chip international companies. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so when you're when you're saying about designing space, like how how important do you think it is to these organisations to design a space that is like you say inspiring? We've been using the phrase "better than home" recently uh, because of everything that's happened. With COVID, what we've sort of started to see is it's the really big organisations that really understand their employees that are really getting it. They're sort of really starting to look at what your environment's like, how you, well, a, how you're working from home, what can they do to help you, and then b, one of the biggest things that we've noticed with big organisations we've worked with before, before when they when they try and do remote le remote working, their culture starts to evaporate really quickly. It just goes, you know, um, quite famously, like Coca-Cola, Yahoo, people like that. They tried uh, remote working and they just felt that everyone started doing fairly productive work, but sort of siloed working as well. So what was happening is different departments were operating OK, but as a whole, the business just wasn't functioning as a as a, like, you know, it wasn't growing the way they wanted it to. So we think the office is very important. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, um, <laughs> but. But what's, what's stopped working is collaboration. So a lot of mentoring and, and working with your colleagues is just out the window. It's just not the same, especially for us as a creative organisation, you know, that walking past someone's Mac to see what they're working on, you know, it, we're very much in the danger. We can have somebody working in the completely the wrong direction for a couple of days, whereas normally I'd pick up on that just by walking around the studio. So collaboration is gone. Creativity is out the window, which is the sort of silo thing. So. We're talking about creativity, about how all, as an organisation is creative, which is where all the inspirational and fun stuff comes from. Uh, and, and, you know, just sort of groundbreaking developments within an organisation is kind of gone because of this siloed working. And everyone's sort of still reacting to COVID. Um, creativity, collaboration and culture uh, is the most important one for us. So if you think of a culture, people sort of talk about culture as you know, the beliefs and practices of an, as an organisation and, and what you sort of push forward. And it's really hard to do that when you're all sort of scattered to the four winds. Um, so a lot of work's been having to be done on, on keeping that culture alive, really. And, and we're sort of working a lot with big organisations to work out what their back-to-work looks like and then uh, how you sort of really bring that culture back. Um, one of the things we were thinking about, and we talk about this a lot with our clients, is that, you know, what? why would someone work for you over your competitor if you're working from home? So if you didn't go back to the office, which <laughs> businesses are thinking of doing that, why would I be inspired to come and work for Jamie uh, over your biggest competitor when I'm basically going to be stood in my shed, boiling <laughs> in the middle of summer, uh, apart from the culture and the difference that you're going to give me and make me feel about working with you, basically? Do you, do you think that's the same for customers as well, though? Because, like, yeah. with, with having a culture, you know, from a business organization, like you say, there's nothing that differentiates you from another employer. 
So if you're an accountant and you're working for an accountancy practice and then another accountancy practice comes in and says, oh, we'll offer you a little bit more money, um, a little bit more convenience. You can work from home as well. It's like, oh, well, why wouldn't I do that? Because nothing's nothing's changing for you culturally. And the same for customers as yeah. well. So customers are like, well, okay, what's what's your culture about? Why should I buy from you as opposed to, or that accountant as opposed to that accountant? I'm just using that as an example because yeah. it's the industry that I've worked in for so many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. Well, I think we see it as, you know, you've got, is like a very massively overlapping Venn, Venn diagram where your brand is almost your customer-facing aspect. And your culture, I think of it as quite internal, but more and more now we're seeing organizations talk about their culture to their customers. So, for example, with us, uh, things that happen in our culture, we, we've, we've really got to be sort of preaching, uh, acting what we preach. So if we're working with people like McKinsey and, uh, and Primark and people like that, where they're putting a vested interest in their, cust- in their, in their staff, we've got to demonstrate we do the same thing. So... Yeah. We do things like uh, we do a wellness Wednesday. So every Wednesday morning we have a, a fitness session with a personal trainer. Yeah. So we log on uh, with a Zoom. At work we've got vitamins galore. We get fruit delivered when we're in work. We're not so much now, obviously. Uh, and, you know, we try and keep that culture alive. We do the quiz Fridays and stuff, which isn't massively original. But all these things that we try and do to sort of build this layer of a community within the workspace – uh, that we sort of uh, really invest quite a bit of time in, actually. And, and on Fridays, we do this thing called Creative Friday. So you, as a designer, get to work on whatever you want to do on Friday afternoon, uh, as long as it is, is cool and uh, will do benefit for the business, basically. Yes, it sounds, sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. It's, it's very difficult, isn't it, as um, a business owner to maintain that culture and keep your mm. staff interested um keep them interested in work keep keep them interested in actually continuing to work for you especially if they're world class and i guess in, in your in your experience do you think you know chain having a good culture having a good workplace do you think that attracts better people yeah definitely and i think it's one of the things we can use as a small organization i mean we're, we're a team of 10 uh hope, hope we get back to 12 again uh, shortly but we're quite small um so our competitors usually start at around 30 people plus. So we're yeah. trying to chase the same people and they can usually offer quite a lot more money than us. So what we've done is a bit more of a lifestyle business is uh, we've opened an office in Barcelona. We've opened in an office in New York, hopefully in the next few months. Um, and what we're saying to people is like, you can work anywhere in the world if you like, you know, as long as you do work with us, go and work in the New York office or come back over to Barcelona I can't wait personally to start working in Barcelona. Uh, <laughs> any excuse to have meetings there, even from people yeah. from London. <laughs> let's meet let's meet Barcelona. Um, but but those things are really important. And I find myself talking a lot about those within like interviews and stuff. We talked to someone really interested in New York. Uh, and you could tell that he she came away really inspired, you know, like they were thinking, mm-hmm. Oh, I can see myself fitting into that. I like the idea of Creative Fridays, that ticks a few boxes for me. Yeah. I like to work in Barcelona every now and again. Um so just those little I guess we'd see them as perks, but we see it as part of our culture of, you know, it's it's kind of been driven by me because it's it's something I want to do. I want to work in Barcelona. I quite like to work in Singapore too. So look out Singapore will be opening up there soon. Um you know, but it's sort of like fueling what inspires me. And I, I guess I attract like for like, uh, like minded people. Um, we, we've been really, we're obviously doing something right because we've been picking up some incredible people. We've headhunted two guys from uh, WeWork, uh, the, like right. creative director of South America, and one's creative director of the UK and wow. uh, Europe. So, um, and, and, you know, it's quite hard to woo someone away from WeWork, but I think what we're offering is a bit more fun and exciting um, yeah. in, a, in a way, you know, like that, that get, makes them feel that they've got an opportunity to make a bit more of their own stamp on things. And, uh, yeah, it's, it seems to be ticking some boxes. But <laughs> Do you think that spills over into, um, like, family life as well? So, you know, having a culture in your organisation, do you find some of those things actually spill over into your, your home life as well? You know, I'd like to think they did. Um, I, 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 oh God, I, we were talking just before we came online, on live. I really suffered during uh, the lockdown. You know, we, 
have it, try to run your own business, as you well know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners uh, will agree. It's it's hard work, you know. You you, the, you you sort of anyone I meet who thinks I've got who finds out I've got my own business, they immediately think I'm minted. <laughs> they always think, you know, it's easy life, and I'm just sort of like a few phone calls a day, directing a few people. But we all know the reality of it is. You work harder than most. You're doing all the hours. You know, um, if you're not working on it, you're thinking about it. And I, I think that what the COVID period taught me was that I probably put in too much effort to work, and uh, I probably haven't put enough thought into my home culture. Actually, mm. um, I've, I, the girls now shut my laptop if it's past six o'clock. <laughs> I've got a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old in it. And they get quite grumpy with me if I try, if I'm answering phone calls or texting and stuff like that. And it, I, that all feels like part of my business that I need to do all the time. And um, yeah. I, I think I haven't quite got the balance right yet. But what lockdowns taught me is that I, I do like being at home, and the kids love me being there. And I, I think I need to put a little bit more effort into the culture of my own home. <laughs> and I, I think that's the thing, isn't it? With um, with everything that you're doing for these large organizations is designing this this culture and designing these workplaces for people and mm. it's almost like the polar opposite is the um you know the benefits as a parent for actually being at home yeah. now i've seen you know i've seen the benefits but i've also seen the drawbacks because all of a sudden i've gone from being the hero when i get home to being somebody that's ignoring my children yeah um, yeah so it's it's it's, fantastic. it's been fantastic from the aspect of like with Alara being able to see her, um, you know, see her mm-hmm. smiling every day. Um, but then I would be lying to say that it's not very disruptive. And then um, Jackson is like knocking on the door trying to get in, you know, so it's, it's very difficult to stay productive mm. <laughs> when you've got all those nice nice challenges um to to deal with um so when when it comes to organizations do you do you see um you were talking about coca-cola and somebody else yeah like a difference in their their productivity from home base Um, i mean to be honest a lot of the stuff i'm seeing now so this they were quite old projects and and to be honest coca-cola a lot you yahoo weren't ones we worked on personally but it's just stuff that i've heard information from yeah but um, we, we, what we've seen, so I've been looking at a lot of data and research, and basically what happened was everybody was very productive for the first year. Now, these are always from questionnaires where people are asked how productive they are. So even if they're anonymized, people are thinking, I'll put pretty high. I don't want to be the first people, person to be let go, right? <laughs> you know. So that how accurate is the productivity? I don't know. I don't know. A lot of people, like my missus, who's definitely more introverted than I am, I'm I'm an extrovert, and um, I think I, I'm i more inspired. My energy comes from working with people, bouncing ideas off each other, and, you know, being involved. My idea of sitting in a shop, standing as I am now in a shed, taking <laughs> out proposals is the, my least inspiring <laughs> mode of working. So I find it really difficult. My missus thinks it's the best thing since life's bed being at home. So... People get their energy for different things, and, and you know she finds a really focused work. She can deliver stuff really quickly. You know, there's a lot of stuff she can get through. So different modes of working. Oh yeah, yeah sorry. The, the, the research on that said though. So I, I always assumed that extroverts would say I'm not very productive. I'm not getting much of this done, uh, and the introverts would be saying, Yeah, this is brilliant. I love it. But they're actually fairly similar in their feedback. Right. That both like, even the extroverts are saying, Yeah, we've been quite productive. They're, they think they're being as productive or a little under productive from what they work for. And that worked well for about a year. What happened there was um, everyone had been working on adrenaline for so long. And then after a year, we went into the second lockdown. It was a bit like, well, we have to keep doing this. And <laughs> it just dropped off a cliff because everyone's like, oh, fuck it. Yeah, I can't, can't keep doing this. This is killing me. And I think everyone just took their foot off the gas a bit. And I think the uh, the stop start, stop start, um, um, and the the lack of clarity around lockdown. Because I don't know about yourself, but when that first attempt at releasing the lockdown happened, we got really busy. Loads of proposals. Everything started to fly. Um, and after that, the minute it got locked down again, everything just stopped. And it just yeah. and it hasn't started back up really proper. Yeah. for quite a while since since then and i think this other four weeks is another killer for everybody else i think um 
So yeah, I think mentally the productivity is really difficult. I think at the moment. Yeah, it's it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, we're we're trying to balance so many different things and so many different personalities. And I think you know, for large organisations in particular, it's very difficult for them to to almost instill that culture, especially yep. when people aren't there. You know, when when people are there, it's very easy to remind them of that culture. And they and I guess you know, as, <laughs> these large organisations aren't going to do custom offices for for yeah. everyone to work from home. <laughs> yeah, hey, we're, we're, we're going to put a pool table in your back garden, and <laughs> we're going to put a, a pinball machine in your back garden, and we're going to build you your own fancy little office with a spa yeah. facility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you just need to look at a WeWork office, so it, which I think is some of the best designs. You know, they're, they're some phenomenal spaces. They're all unique. You you go there and you're proud to take your client there. You're proud to go and work yeah. there. And then, and or you've got the option of working from your kitchen table and blurring your <laughs> background. It's a bit. Um, I think I think especially parents. I mean, I've a lot of people I found are really tired now. You know, like even yeah. though the kids are back at school, I think we all really experienced that trying to juggle jobs and do like home care was nearly impossible. I think everyone's got, I mean, not that I didn't respect <laughs> teachers before, but God, they're, they're, they're amazing, aren't they? Like the, yeah. the stuff that they were sending out from our school was just really helpful and useful. But as a parent, the, the, the logistics were nearly impossible, weren't they? When you're trying to work from home, <laughs> you've got one kid in one room doing English, you've got another one doing mathematics and it's a completely different level of year, you know, and, I think it, it it was a really testing time for all of us, and I think um, our kids are probably more relieved to go back to school now than we are to them go back. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm lucky in that respect because Toby had only just started school, so right. he, he wasn't he wasn't having to do like a broad range of subjects, so to speak. But you know, it wasn't like challenging subjects. I wasn't having to change the different things, but it was yeah i'd be lying if i said it wasn't challenging because you're trying to do that whilst also trying to continue to do all of your work and then you've got yeah. appointments and then my wife had appointments as well so we're trying to manage between those and then we're getting we're, we're tired as well because we're trying to do all of that and you're burning the candle at both ends and probably yeah. even in the middle as well it's just it's it was yeah it was a very very stressful stressful period and i think you know, to have a bit of respite to actually go to the office or at least have the choice to go to the office. Yeah. You know, I'd be lying if I said I, I wouldn't, that's not attractive to me right now. You know, I've built, built this office that I'm in and I'm very proud of the office that I've got and it's air conditioned and it's inspirational uh, place to work. But when I've got the kids knocking on the door, <laughs> daddy, daddy, can, can, can you just come and have a look at this? Yeah, yeah, just one <laughs> minute, straight out looking at that thing and then i'm like what, what was i doing right i was doing some copy for something okay right okay do that there and then yeah. and then it'll be the next one comes in jackson's like daddy 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 i'm like right okay off again and we're on the trampoline and you know it's fantastic for my my home life uh, my home life is really really good but then work and productivity yeah no it wasn't wasn't yeah, good it's tricky yeah, I, I, I may or may not have been guilty of inventing some meetings that I had to attend. <laughs> <laughs> I've been quite lucky, actually. I've got my shed in my garden. I think the novelty of coming out and bothering me came sort of start to get wetted about after three months. So, um, <laughs> especially in the cold of winter. But yeah, yeah, we've sort yeah of I'm, not, I'm not walking down to the shed. It's raining. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, fair, that, that was a good period yeah so when it was raining it was great because yeah they they, they weren't coming back down to the shed but I, again i i feel i feel like we're blessed then to actually have an office in the shed because i remember working actually in the house and i've got to say like that is the worst period of work i've ever had because my wife was like well, well you're in the house you're it's home time now like it's like no i'm still working yeah you know, and all i've done is stop to go and get a coffee or you know, I I don't know whether you ever did this, like walk around the office and just get your thinking head on. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean... Um, I, she's I, like, well, you're not working. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, we, we, we're looking at it from one angle as well. We're quite lucky in that we've got property and yeah. you, you might have a spare room and you've been able to yeah. transform one into a shed, uh, sorry, an office. But 
you know, there's a huge amount of the workforce who are in shared accommodation or they're sharing with their husband and they haven't got an extra room, you know. Um, and it, it's very difficult to sit around a kitchen table that's ergonomically incorrect and you've yeah. got to try and focus while you, somebody else is on a Skype call. And, you know, you, it's it's really, really difficult. And I think a lot of the feedback we can stay, sort of dig into, I think a lot of it's quite biased because it's people that are in quite senior positions saying, well, I'm loving working from home because I've got this big, lovely space. But they're forgetting as some of them about their workforce. And yes, I have to say that the, the culture thing it, it what is what differentiates the big businesses. So when we work with massive businesses that are super successful, you can immediately tell the difference between working there and somewhere else. Just, They've got the culture down. It's a bit like the, you know, the British cycling 1%, you know, the chase chasing yeah. the 1% improvement all the time. I think, if I'm really honest, the, the difference we might make in as, a, as an organisation in what we do, when we go in and we talk about brand and culture stuff, it's probably like, you know, it's only maybe 5%, 10% of the bottom line, you know, percentage-wise of an improvement. But because they've done all the other stuff so well, this this has another massive uplift for them. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, organisation like McKinsey, um, uh, Primark, and people like that, where they really look after their staff. You see all these sort of horror stories uh, about certain organisations not treating people properly, banning unions and things like that. You know, um, but they're, they're not. I don't think they're going to be around then. <laughs> no, no, no. Exactly. I, d I just not don't. Think it's, it's not sustainable. No. And then you've got. You might have a rival company like a Virgin or whatever, sort of giving people 40 weeks or as many holidays as they want and things like that. And I think that that is going to be the future. What what this has given us a taste of is every one of us as well. You, you know, you're going to really struggle. Everybody here will really struggle to say to your staff, right, come on then, five days a week, everybody. I want you, I want you in at nine o'clock. Don't worry about the rush hour. People are just going to refuse it, and if they if yeah. if you try and force that on them, they're going to find somebody who isn't doing that to them, and and you'll lose your best staff. I think. Yeah, definitely, and I it, you you're hitting a, a very good pain point and topical point of conversation mm -hmm. because I I feel like the nine to five is is dead or dying um, yeah. because we you know as a parent you know. I might get that inspiration at seven o'clock at night. So if I've got the ability to go into the office, I've got no traffic. I can go into the office, get my work done, come back. The kids are already in bed at seven. Well, I'd like to think they were in bed at seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone knows any tips on how to get your, your bed into your children into bed oh, at yeah. seven o'clock, <laughs> please please do share in the comments below. Um, but yeah, but having that ability to just you know go and go into the office and, and go and do something mm. is cool. so much more powerful. And having that inspirational you know workplace, um, you know, for me right now, it sounds like heaven. <laughs> yeah, well, what 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 we're telling our clients to do is think about the purpose of their workspace. So, like, let's throw it all out the window. You know, let's get rid of the banks of desks. This, that, and the other. What can you do? There's, there's someone who designs up. Uh, an architect called Jenny Jones, who does amazing architecture, she talks about this threshold. So if you're going into work and you want meetings, what should the meeting space look like? And then if you cross over into another threshold, very much like a sort of Japanese house layout, yeah. you literally go over a threshold and the space feels very different. So you might have yeah. focused bits where you can go and escape from someone. So like little hidden cubby holes that people won't be able to find you in. You might have a, a focused space where you can work with a team or a space where you can work on your own, but are findable. And then you might have collaboration spaces and creative sort of brainstorming areas that might be able to transform into a cafe area or somewhere that becomes the heart of the building where you go and eat with your friends and things. And I love that way of thinking about what thresholds, and very few of us have got offices this big, but one of the things that we like to think about, um, and it sort of inspired a, a new idea for us, which is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, is, is, you know, just what do you do in the office and what are you missing right now that you were doing before? And that yeah. you can start to build stuff around that basically. Um, back to Maslow, what we found really interesting during like during the lockdown, we keep coming up in conversation from various people. I know, I know a few psychologists we're talking about Maslow and I don't know if you're familiar with the Maslow's pyramid or Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's, it's basically, a pyramid made up of five layers and the, the base layer is physiological and that's about everything you need to be to survive 
the above that safety, which is like keeping everyone safe. So you've got your things, now you're keeping them safe and you're safe. And you've got belonging, which is about your community and, and your family and everything else. And the layer up from that is your self-esteem. That's being proud of what you do, mm. you know, and, and being proud of yourself and feel like you're achieving stuff. And then there's um then there's self-actualization, uh, which is about spirituality. So we're really reaching the pinnacle. Now, whenever I was taught this at university, you look at that and you just say, yeah, physiological, got that down. Yeah, that's fine. Safety, yeah, of course, we're safe. And then community, yeah, yeah, I've got friends and blah, blah, blah. So you really started to focus on the self-esteem and the self-actualization as the pinnacle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and everything else was just a, 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 forget, like a given. I mean, we live in a Western society, you know, we're quite yeah. we're lucky, we're rich. But when COVID came in, steaming through, um, everything just got knocked down. So yes. you, you've got to have the base of the pyramid to build everything else. And so the physiological yeah. stuff, you were in this really scary zone where, you go to the supermarket, you couldn't get food that you wanted. You're starting to think, yeah. shit, am I going to not get any food? Is, is this what's going to happen now? Do I need to stock up or can't even yeah. get toilet rolls? God, what if I don't get paid this month? You know, like you're in yeah. this like, really dangerous environment. So I won't be able to pay for my mortgage. I haven't got home. Oh my God, what am I going to do? So this is like, like the physiological world got whipped away and then safety, but this killer virus out there that no one really knew what to do with. So we were suddenly like really nervous. We might catch flu. We had to wear masks and didn't touch people and blah, blah, blah. And then belonging got whipped away too. So that was like, yeah. oh, you can't go and see anyone. We're going to lock down. You're only going to see your own family and that's it. Mm. Goodbye. So self-esteem and self, self actualization were irrelevant to us by this point, you know. So yeah. everyone felt all really wobbly and uncomfortable. But starting with that, what we've done is worked out – I mean, this, this is relevant to building a culture. It's relevant to sort of building a brand as well. But basically, we worked out seven different items for each of those and created something uh, we've call, called a wheel, uh, where the physiological, uh, if you're going into the design an office space, for example, you break out into personal space, light, food, uh, relaxation, air, shelter, and clothing, and things like that. So – and you, you, we score each of those out of five. Then you go on to safety, which is about, I'm reading it off another screen, you can probably tell, is about yeah. personal security, emotional security, health, well-being, safety from accident, safety from illness, and then financial security. And we score them out of five. And we basically work with organizations to build a roadmap around how to improve on them. For us, So that those are the two things you have to get right, the physiological and the safety. Then everything else is a bonus. But... We work through it. So belonging is about community and culture. So you work through community, human connectivity, digital connectivity, personal privacy, family, friendships, and works, workplace. And, and for us, it's like the, the, the belonging is, as a parent, feeling welcome to have kids. Like my, my yeah. wife worked in a massive, really successful organization, international, American-based uh, and when we had our second kid, we, we, she just didn't feel like she was wanted there. After being there, having yeah. a brilliant career, she was suddenly in this situation where she was being told, well, no, you have to come back within two months or we're going to get your job up. And like, loads of like, really dodgy <laughs> stuff that they shouldn't have been saying, uh, yeah. but they had a quite an American approach to it. And it was like, well, you know, you're going to have to wait eight, eight till six or, or, or later. You know, that's, that's just the job. Um, and, and we're even using things like, well, you, hasn't your husband got his own business? Surely he can do more of the child <laughs> and stuff. It was it was quite surreal. So one of the key things for us as an organisation, and, and we sort of try and look at with with people, is is about that being part of a community is a bigger thing than just mm -hmm. getting on with people at work. It's like, do you feel welcome to have your friend? Your can you bring your kids into work? Even yes. What support do they give them? Um, and then similarly on self-esteem, like, you know, we've, we've picked out parenting, but that's part of your personal goals, your predict productivity, uh, being her, developing traits and stuff, talents and stuff. Uh, and then the self-actualization part of this wheel is uh, purpose, recognition, respect, spirituality, creativity, culture, and connected to nature. And um, these are all sort of focused on offices, but we love pulling apart things like psychology and what drives people to build a culture around it. And I think, what we've succeeded in doing with Maslow, I'm sure he'd be turning in his grave if he saw it, but um, is, is we've sort of tried to unpick something so you can actually work through it and go, actually, we're not very good at that. We should improve. Mm. Um, and I'm sure there's most organisations that, that think they could probably improve on how they work with parents. Well, I think I think you're, you're 
you're hitting the nail on the head and i'd i'd it doesn't matter whether you're a large organization or running a small business or running an online mm -hmm. business or whatever business that you're running you know you're you're hitting the nail on the head you know maslow's hierarchy of needs covers five areas that we have to cover even if even if we're one solopreneur as they call it yeah. you know as a solopreneur we have to make sure all of those bases are covered because yeah, yeah. If we don't cover those bases, then how can we, how can we grow? How can we make more money? How can we bring on more customers? Because if, if we're, you know, those basic needs, if we haven't got those basic needs met, you know, how do we, how are we ever going to make it to self-actualization? We're not. Yeah, and I think that's it. It's like you can look at it from a personal point of view, you can look from a business point of view, and from a brand point of view. You know, yeah, all of these things are so essential to get right. And I think it makes it's the difference between having a successful organization. Actually, um, I spent years just like most entrepreneurs, you know, you're good at something, so you yeah. think you can do better than my boss. Uh, so, therefore, um, I, I will start my business and I'll be really successful. And then you go, okay, so how do I write an invoice? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there's so much you've got to learn. And I think for years, I think, I mean, especially because I started the business so young at 29, and, and we've been running for 17 years now, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 46 and still learning a lot. But <laughs> what, what I've found is the more of this stuff we're getting right, the mm. easier things start to go with employees or finding people to employ. And, and even having it all this stiff down, it differentiates us when we're going to pitch for something as well. Because we, we don't really pitch for work. If we're asked to do a proposal or a pitch, we refuse to pitch, but we will, we will go and meet people. Um, because I, I I I don't know if if you're in that sort of industry, but pitching for work I think can be the biggest drain on talent and time, and can be incredibly frustrating if you don't win anything. Whereas we go in and we talk about all this stuff, and we talk about how we look after our our staff and our employees and the culture within the organisation, and the fact we do buy one give one, which is a, a charitable organisation, and that we sort of actively fight against gender inequality, both in the office, but externally as well so that's the thing we've selected as our all of our uh, un sustainability goals it's easy for me to say but any charities that we we can connect with usually have something to do with uh, female equality uh, and we've got a massive team of women so um i think i think it was 70 30 so we've got a lot of really talented women that work for us and, and what what we tend to do is if you win a project you get to pick what charity we're going to put some money towards Amazing. and things like that. Just, and it's stuff like that that wins us work. Not, not, Hey, we've come up with a lot of ideas for you. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, right? we're, uh, we're so brilliant. We've won so many awards. Wow. We're amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, less, less about you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's asking the right questions, isn't it? That gets well, you that, yeah, I, I'm pleased you said that because pitching is, is, it's a difficult art in its own right. And I know there's loads of pitch people out there were saying, you know, you've got to pitch, 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 but you know, there's different ways of attracting customers. And one of those ways is through your culture, you know, yeah. and having well, that giving culture, having that contribution culture, having that um, community culture, which is what we're we're trying to do here as the parental CEO. We're trying to create that culture of you know come together, bringing parents that, that that are in business together to help each other. Yeah, you know ultimately because you know I don't know about you Dan, but you know as a parent I've I've struggled at times, and there's been times I'm like, well, you know who do I turn to? Who do I talk to? Um, and then as a business owner, I'm struggling with things and you know, having somewhere where I can go and just yeah. kind of have a conversation with somebody who actually knows what I'm going through. Mm. I think the, biggest, the biggest change in my career was getting a mentor, first of all. Yeah. Gary Pratt, who's incredible. Uh, you know, he's run an agency for much longer than I ever have uh, and just told me straight that I was doing things wrong in some certain circumstances. You know, he was like, no, don't do that and do this. You should be there. Yeah. Why aren't you doing this? And so that was the biggest game change for me, having a mentor. Second thing, obviously training. I spend a lot of money on, on developing myself. Um, my wife would say it's probably wasted money. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, the third big thing for me was really sort of focusing on a niche. So finding our niche. And that was, you know, we could have been a generic branding agency forever, you know, and, and for, you know, I could have been, ringing you before this saying oh jamie you're doing your branding you know like that that could have been me now 
Well, what we've done is we, we've, we've completely differentiated ourselves. So we've got a really specialist focus. We go in and transform workspace. You know, yes. um, there's not a lot of people out there doing that. So we can, you know, we, we the conversations are much easier. So that when you're talking about pitching, so if you're a specialist in, um, you know, obviously you're, you've got a counter, but it's like you, you've got a focal point in a certain character, like client niche that you focus on. It's yeah. much easier for you to say, oh, actually, you're you're perfect for me because that's the only type of people I work on compared to uh, an accountant coming along. Sorry, my computer's got mental. I'm going to try and stop my... <laughs> I was wondering whether that was my computer or yours. Oh, it's just, just re remixing it. We'll have to uh, just start singing, Dan, or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um... Just let yeah, the camera it's, roll. It's a lot easier <laughs> if, um, if if you're competing against a more generic, um, a more generic accountant, say, uh, who isn't a specialist in your sector. Yeah, and they, they, I think there's a lot of fear around niching or niching, as some people like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's it's a it's a definite fear because they think, oh well, you know, if I go with everyone, I've got. 100 million people that can buy my product uh, but if i if i niche down or niche down um you know i've only got like a thousand people that will buy my product yeah. But, yeah but when you actually go and do the numbers and you go actually how many customers do i need you know and how much do i need to charge okay if i charge this amount of money five thousand pounds and have a hundred customers oh <laughs> that's a lot of money yeah i, I think the specialism you can charge a premium but like one somebody a guy called uh, Stuart Sherman. I met a guy from Canada. He runs a design agency, right? And he, he wasn't a mentor of mine, but he said probably one of the most influential things of anyone. And he looked at my client database and he went, "Why do you work with such small organisations?" I said, "What do you mean?" I was a bit offended because they were fairly decent sizes as far as I was concerned. He says, "The problem with the people you're working with," he says, "They've probably got ten grand for a budget." But that's the only 10 grand they've got. They've got 10 grand. And if you go over that, they will hate you. And if you <laughs> try to achieve that, what they want to do within that 10 grand, it's always going to be just a little shy of what they really wanted. He says, I have businesses that I that charge me, I charge hundreds of thousands of pounds. And when I say to them, I need another 500,000 pounds, they go, okay. Because the specialism is understood. You know, you go in, yeah. you're working with a much bigger organization. They know why you've brought you in. Um, they know why they've brought you in. They know yeah. that you're a specialist and they know you're an expert and that you're going to pay for a premium for that service, right? So it, when you're going in and saying, oh, you know what, this, you're a bit shy on the budget here, they go, okay, we'll tell you how much it is. And there's not much of an argument about it. Um, as you know, I did an experiment. Um, because we work on these massive projects, they can last two or three years. And I had an idea to do small brands for small aid, like for small organizations, just startups and entrepreneurs. And we've done this really wonderfully packaged up plan of three and a half grand and you could come in we're going to do your brand strategy blah 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 blah. bosh you out three amazing logos and you pick one and off you go and i thought this is great it's simple and it's like cool food for the designers so they can be doing like yeah. the cool little projects while they're doing these big long painful ones you know that that take years and and it was it was so painful it was just like stepping back to when i started the organization um and we were fighting over 500 quid with people or they wouldn't pay us or whatever. You know, it was just like, oh, God. And it's literally like it was their life savings, the last bit of their life savings. And they didn't want to part with it. And they wanted to direct us because their wife liked the color green. You know, it's like, oh, we don't like this color. And uh, have you seen this font on this crisp packet I like? And you, you, it was a <laughs> your belief. But so, yeah, long story short, the caliber of your clients is really important. And I think that we only managed to get to the caliber of our clients now because of the specialism that we created. Um, and now we're seen as that a specialist in that sector. And it's not, it's not really difficult for us to get international blue chip clients anymore. Whereas I used to fight with other agencies over a 10 grand job, frankly. Yeah. And there's, there's thousands of them. Those blue exactly. chip companies. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. You, don't, you don't need to work with all of them. And, and I bet at no point do they say, what's your hourly rate? <laughs> Mm. Completely. We we do get that asked sometimes in pitches, but we try and avoid answering it. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's I just it's, 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 it's really just... take you that long, then. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, it, it's it's amazing because I think you're right. When you're dealing with customers that you know that that are penny pinchers, that are looking for that everything for nothing, uh, because yeah. Yeah. let's be right, they haven't got the budget. They haven't got the yeah. budget. And it's say, it is their last five hundred quid, and if yeah. it's their last five hundred quid, they yeah. want to make that work for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it, it is. It's literally too personal for them. Like. By the time that we're taken on by an organization uh, that's the scale that we're talking about, we've gone through the vetting process. Everyone's looked at our portfolio. They know what standard of work we've got and what results we get, more importantly. And yeah. they kind of let you get on with it. Obviously, they approve stuff, but they, yeah. they kind of think you're the expert. Come and tell me what I need to get done, please. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, yeah, somebody that's got the start of business, what's their logo done, um, as they call it, rather than the brand? Uh, I need a logo. <laughs> Um, they've never bought a logo before. They don't know how to brief you. They don't know how to work with you. And that's, I do think that's our responsibility to solve that. But yes. even feedback is a challenge because people just think they can change their mind every two minutes and whimsically alter stuff. And yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a minefield. So and, and, an expensive and, lesson learned. <laughs> we, we're, we're small business owners. We don't, we don't always understand what's best for us. So yeah. sometimes we, we might we might look at a logo and think, oh, I don't like that. But actually, in truth, our opinion doesn't really matter because in yeah. truth, it's the customer's opinion that matters. Yeah. yeah. And when you're working with a branding agency like yourself, you know, that's why projects take years is I imagine the amount of research that you have to do to understand their culture, to understand, you know, what what their staff want. I imagine that that's why those projects go on for that length of time. Uh, I, actually, the, the initiation, the concept stuff is actually fairly quick. It's just usually we're part of we're part of a construction project, and the construction takes a couple of years, basically. Right, so fair enough. Okay, it's, fair uh, enough. We'll we'll do the big concept stuff at the start, and that you can do fairly rapidly, actually. But mainly down to the way that we've got, got our systems sorted out and how we can get in there using Maslow to sort of interpret what people should should be looking for. So there's all the systems and stuff that has improved and, and made that much quicker. Uh, but but we then have to dip in and dip in. So like when it's different stages of construction, Reba stage four, five, and six, we're we're doing different things, and then and then there's the installation stuff. So that's tends to be why it takes years for that. But yeah, but really, you know, a proper brand, yeah, it does take. A long I, time. I like I like what you were saying as well because you've gone through you've gone through that transition. You you started you started it with maybe the smaller work, mm. making loads of mistakes. You got a mentor. You then started making the different mistakes, but your your business started working. You started getting those larger customers. You then went backwards, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, to then to then move forward again. And I I, I really yeah. like that as a story because it's it, it is that entrepreneurial journey, and we we're placing that entrepreneurial bet. You know, will this will this work or can this work? And actually, no, you know, it, it, it's against it goes against our culture. You know, we. We're not working with the customers that we know we can help. Um, it goes against our niche or niche or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I, when I had a bit of a sort of awakening. And, and the reason we got our niche on was we just just after the Lehman Brothers crash. So what's that, 10 years ago, 12 years ago? Um, yeah. It's uh, basically after the Lehman Brothers crash, basically I went in for a pitch for a 30 grand job. It was nothing major. Our type of client, art sector, you know, this is when I was a sort of jobbing designer, graphic designer uh, with a branding agency. We sort of specialized a lot in art stuff, and art's are wonderful to work with, but I never have any money. But we were doing this rebrand in a website for somebody for 30 grand, and I came out the pitch thinking, smashed it, uh, thinking we got it, you know. Um, and there was three people from, I think it was Sarchi and Sarchi's, sat there with portfolios in the, in the reception, and I was thinking, Ooh, what are you doing in my world? This is not good. You know, like, so after the crash, basically, um, their whole business had decided if you've met your break even point, everything else is profit move on to so go for everything you see. And they did. And they were sending people out to win present. Like so they won the project. And I had, I, it really shook me at the time. It really sort of wobbled me. And I thought, God, I, I can't, I can't really operate against Saatchi and Saatchi. What's my point of difference? What am I doing? And I really mulled over it for probably a year and a half, two years. Um, couldn't quite work it out. So it's not an easy fix, this, but I would I would get anybody to think about the best job they ever did. What was the thing? And Because that's where I ended up, basically. 
Yeah. When I worked at a company called Navy Blue, I'd worked on a call center for Orange, um, and it involved changing the, the, the design of the call center, it, but only with graphics. And what happened was the call center the, at the time was hemorrhaging staff, you know, really high turnover, weird culture there. You had to have to put your hand up to go to the toilet, things like that. Um, but we came up with some really in, innovative, ing, like ingenious little ideas like rolling clouds being projected on the ceilings and stuff like that it, it, on a fairly low budget. It was about 100 grand for the whole building. And, um, but what happened was the the the, um, the job turn, the turnover dropped off, so the, the people were staying longer, people were happier. And what the thing that struck me as I was a customer, I could tell which call center was. There's two side by side. We'd only worked on one, and if you picked up the phone and rang Orange at the time to pay your bill or whatever, I knew immediately which call center I've got just from how happy the person was. You know, if we rang, if we rang the one we worked on, people were like, "Hey, how are you doing, Orange?" Blah blah blah. And if you rang the other one, it, it just somebody just sounded like, "Oh, kill me now." It was literally like oh, <laughs> Orange, um, and I thought, "Well, that's really empower- That's really important and impactful." So, if I can harness a bit of that and go off to some other projects, and we were really lucky. Literally, after I made that decision, we were awarded a project with Maury Smith Architects, who we work with, we still work with now, to do uh, uh, Primax head offices. Uh, and and that was the sort of trigger for everything else, basically. Um, so that that was, you know, if you're at all frustrated or worried about what your niche is, just think about the best job you ever did and why you loved it. And I think then you can start to build other projects around that. And I think that that's a really good way to go. Um, well, I'm going to say I hope hope everyone's writing this down because my my next question was going to be what was your most imp- important piece of advice to uh, parents in being a successful business owner? But I think you've just kind of nailed it in that that sentence there. I'm also conscious of time um, because you and I could probably talk all day, Dan. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to... One other point, actually, before you wrap up, sorry. Yeah, no, go off it. It's, it's culture. So culture, it's about culture internally, and it probably doesn't feel that important to people right now to have the right culture, but having your culture down now is so important to finding the right customers and finding the right staff, and that's something we did too late. So I wish I'd done that sooner. We've been very lucky with our staff, to be fair, but we were never that hard on... On, on who we should employ. We just went after every project we could get. And I wish I'd been a bit firmer on that because I've always thought that the first client you have is it's a matter of leveling up above that and above that and above that. And if you go off in the wrong tangent, you will start to employ like for like clients. And and yeah. unfortunately, we I've been through it, I'm sure other people have been through it, you get to a point where you don't like your own business because you don't relate to it anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's because you got your culture wrong. We now refuse projects that don't fit our culture. It makes a huge difference. Amen. So hopefully everyone's writing that down. So make sure you you focus on your culture. And a great place uh, to start from the sounds of it is from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because mm-hmm. uh, it can be used and so versatile in so many different ways. <laughs> there, there is a video on our website, them.co.uk, um, okay. slash vision 21, number 21. Slash vision 21. So I'll, I'll share that link in the um, the comment section. Cool. So um, I was just about to ask, where, where can people contact you, Dan, uh, if they wanted to find out more information about you and your business? Yeah, so, on LinkedIn as well. You're on LinkedIn as well. So Dan Mosscrop, I'll, again, I'll share your link uh, to LinkedIn in the comment section, and I'll also share that link. You say Vision 21. You can share it with me afterwards, and then I'll share it in the comments. Um, or you can put it in the comments. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. So anyway, thank you ever so much for joining me today, Dan. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Like I say, I, you and I could probably talk all day about this stuff. It's really, really interesting to get your insight. And, you know, what, how long do you say you've been in business now? 17 years? 17 years, yeah. Wow. I've done yeah, so <laughs> so you, you, you've got the experience there. So, um, you know, thanks ever so much. And thank you for bring, bringing your energy, your honesty, um, and u- ultimately your commitment to helping others. The parental CEO has been designed to kind of break the mold. It, it is more of a, a mentality. So it kind of dovetails beautifully what you're saying, like the culture. And it, it's uh, it's about putting your doubts and your fears aside and any excuses and something I believe very, very strongly is we are, we are ultimately stronger together. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, Have an amazing day and thank you, Dan, for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks mate.